Hey everybody, welcome to another GMAT explanation. We're doing this one on the online whiteboard so that we can provide some guidance using this tool for your online GMAT. So let's go ahead and get started on this one. Looks like we don't have any symbols, we don't have exponents, so I would go ahead and use the keyboard. Keyboard tends to be the best, um, the best input tool, unless you've got some stuff that really can't be uh, can't be typed in exponents or an example, or if you've got some function question that has some symbol that you can't that you don't have a keyboard uh, key for, then I would probably use the mouse. But for the most part, the keyboard's faster. The keyboard is neater. So let's go ahead and get this in there. So we've got that, and we're not we're not solving for x or for y. We're wondering whether x. Uh, which one of the answer choices x must be a multiple of. So we're, we're looking for a, a number property of x. Now, let's see what else we've got here. We know that they're positive integers, and we know that y is a multiple of 5. So what I would do is, um, even though that's not complicated, that's not complex information that y is a multiple of 5, um, I would still just list out multiples of 5, positive multiples of 5. So we've got those guys and making lists, making charts, giving yourself examples. Those are the types of things that really, really help in the GMAT. It's not knowing like really complex math. It's not memorizing a whole bunch of, of arithmetic so you can be like a super uh, mental math whiz. It's not about that stuff. It's about this. It's about why is a multiple of five? Okay, let me make that list. Really, really helps. Okay, cool. So we've got some possibilities for why. And I think the name of the game here is just plugging those possibilities into our equation, solving, and then seeing what x we end up with, and then making some inferences from there. So let's go ahead and make another um, text box. Don't be shy about making multiple text boxes. I wouldn't try to do everything in one. It's usually easier to make a couple of them. And so let's start with, uh, with 5, and I'm just going to do some of this in my head, because I know that 4 times 5 is 20. So that's our, our first possibility for x. And I'm just going to keep going here, just down the list. And we know that uh, 10 times 4 is 40, right? You can write this out if you need to. I'm just doing whatever easy math in my head I can. That's not going to be an integer, so because 160 isn't divisible by three, so we don't, we're not going to worry about that one. Also, not going to be an integer. And just for neatness, I'm just going to. Do another one of these over here. Rather than, I don't want to scroll down because I want to keep everything on the page. So just make another uh, text box. And we're at 20, so that's 80. So that works. All right, so now that we've got two examples for x, x could be 60, x could be 40, given the constraints that we have for y. Let's use uh, 60 and 40 to um, eliminate some answer choices. And a3, does, does x have to be a multiple of 3? Well, 40 is not a multiple of 3, so the answer is no. And uh, same with B, because anything that has 3 included doesn't, um, isn't required. It could be, because 60 is a multiple of 3, but 40 isn't. Uh, definitely uh, 7 is not there, because 60 and 40, neither are divisible by 7. 60 is not divisible by 8, and so it's got to be E. So we've proven that by process of elimination. There's nothing, we haven't proven that it has to be 10 because we haven't gone through every possible 
um, multiple of five that y could be, but because a through d, because none of those uh, worked for both 16 and 40, we know that e has to be correct. So that was a really practical way to approach this question. And I think that as an approach, it's actually a really good one and one that you can apply elsewhere on the GMAT. This taking the information, organizing it, making a list, giving yourself some examples, uh, that's 100% GMAT thinking and can be applied all over the exam. There's another way to do this one that's a little bit more, I would say, like a, sort of a, more of a number properties approach. And I think it's equally valid and um, is something that you should also know how to do. So let's tackle this a different way. Uh, but before we do that, let's go over a rule that we're going to use in our work. So if you're divisible by a number, let's say you're divisible by 5. Right? That's applicable here because that's what we're talking about. If you add another number that's divisible by 5, then you will remain divisible by 5. doesn't matter what those numbers are. 5 plus 10, 10 plus 20, 100 plus 305. Whatever numbers you choose, this rule is going to hold up. If you're divisible by 5 and you add another, add another number that's not divisible by, by 5, then you're knocked off course. You're not divisible by 5 anymore. So 5 plus 3 is 8, right? 8's not divisible by 5. 5 plus 6, 5 plus 7, 105 plus 2. Whatever numbers you choose, if you have a mix of divisible by a number plus something that's not divisible by that number, you're going to end up not divisible by that number anymore. The wild card is if you're not divisible. If you combine two of those not divisible guys, that's not predictable. You don't know. Some numbers, um, some numbers will be divisible by five. Some won't. Two plus three is five. Two plus four is six. So with one you ended up divisible. With one you ended up not. Really important rule for the GMAT. You should definitely know this backwards and forwards because it comes up and it makes some questions much, much easier. Okay, so back to the question at hand. We're being asked about x and we've got an equation. So let's see what happens if, if we solve that equation or at least isolate x to see if we can uh, make any inferences. So I'm going to bring y to the other side. And then I notice, oh, I've got a 4 and a 200. So I would go ahead and factor. If you've got some easy factoring, that's a big GMAT thing. Go ahead and try it out. See what happens. OK, so that's what we end up with. And let's think about this rule down here, the divisibility rule. We know that 50 is divisible by 5. We also know that y is a multiple of 5, meaning y is also divisible by 5. So in that parentheses, because we've got divisible by 5 minus divisible by 5, which behaves the same way as plus. Plus and minus are the same with this rule. We know that in the parentheses, we've got divisible by 5. So if you want, we could, we could kind of rewrite that. You don't have to. I'm just doing this for, um, for clarity so that it's really clear what we're talking about. So we've got 4 times a number that's divisible by 5. OK. And we're wondering about the divisibility properties of x, like what is x a multiple of? Well, we know 3x is equal to a number that is both divisible by 4 and divisible by 5. We know that x, or sorry, that 3, is not contributing any of that divisibility in that 3 is not divisible by 4. 3 is not divisible by 5. So 3 is not contributing either of these things. It must, the 4 and the 5 are contained in x, have to be. So then we're guaranteed that x is a number that's divisible by both 4 and 5. So we're looking for an answer choice that has those properties. 
And so we can just go through those answers uh, once again with that information. And we know that A is not working because we're not guaranteed 3, we're guaranteed 4 and 5. B also has 3 in it, so that's not helping us. D is tempting, but we're not guaranteed 8, we're guaranteed 4, so, so that's no good. And E um, has 5 and has 2. You might be saying, well, but what about the 4? Well, the answer choice doesn't have to have everything here. The question is, which one of the following must be a multiple? Well, if X definitely has a 4, then it most certainly has a 2, right? It's okay if you're under a little bit. You just can't be over. Like, 8 doesn't work because there's no 8 here. But 2 works because there's definitely a 2 here because the 4 has a 2 in it. So that would be E once again. You might be wondering which approach is better. GMAT tutoring students tend to like the number properties approach because it's a little slicker and it's a little quicker, I think, to get through. It requires a little less computation. But I think these are equally valid, and I think that they're, they're actually really similar in terms of the thinking involved. You're, you're reading carefully, you're organizing, and then you're making inferences based on that setup. Uh, I think we, we organized these in slightly different ways, but again, I think that the overall thinking uh, was very similar, and it's the type of thinking that you want to apply all over your GMAT. Thanks for watching. Hope you found that helpful. Comment with any questions or with your experiences uh, on this question or using the online whiteboard. We'd love to hear from you. Good luck on your GMAT, and we'll see you next time.